In this video, we'll go over the best level 9 or rank 9 monsters in the game. A level range which is so unpopular that it developed its own soft archetype around it. Where there are a couple of really good support cards for level 9 monsters because of how few of them there were. And at number 10, we have Predaplant Triffy over Rutum. This is a level 9 fusion monster who mainly sees play because it's an excellent super polymerization target if you know you're playing against an opponent who has a lot of dark monsters, as it can allow you to use three of your opponent's monsters for its fusion summon. And since dark monsters are the most popular and numerous attribute in the game, you can't really go wrong playing this card. Although generally, Starving Venom Fusion Dragon is better because it's just a little bit easier to use and only requires two monsters. Even then, Predaplant Triffy over Rutum still sees play because it can get rid of one more than Starving Venom. Now, this card also has a good effect on the field, where once per turn, when your opponent special summons a monster from their extra deck while you control this fusion summon card, you can negate the summon and destroy the monster. So it basically has a once per turn solemn strike effect, which is really good. And it also has a more niche effect where, if it's in the graveyard and your opponent controls a monster with a predator counter on it, you can special summon this card from the graveyard in defense position. Although if summoned in this way, then it can't use its negate, and it's basically just a 3k beat stick on the field. Which isn't half bad either, although most decks that play this card aren't really generating predator counters very much, and that's kind of something for its archetype, which doesn't really see competitive play. A lot of the predator plant cards do see competitive play, but not the archetype itself. And at number 9, we have Infernoid Deviati. This is a level 9 Infernoid monster and is kind of meant as a boss monster for the archetype, as the whole archetype has this little restriction to them, where you can't summon another Infernoid monster if you control effect monsters in the field whose total levels and ranks equal 8 or higher. So bringing out an Infernoid Deviati basically means you can't bring out other Infernoid monsters unless you have Void Imagination out on the field which changes the levels of all of your Infernoid monsters to 1. Now, what Deviati does is when it's special summoned, you can destroy all spell and trap cards on the field except Void cards, which means your Void Imagination or all the other Infernoid support cards. And generally, wiping out all spell and traps is really good. It can also special summon itself from your hand or graveyard by banishing three other Infernoid monsters from your hand or graveyard. And Infernoid decks love to send half their deck to the graveyard on their first turn so they can bring out whichever ones they want. And on top of its ease of summoning and good effect, it also has a spell speed 2 effect where it can tribute a monster to negate the activation and banish a monster that activates its effect. So it gains a monster negate with an excellent removal on top of it. And since a lot of Infernoid decks love to play Layer of Darkness, you can just kind of tribute one of your opponent's monsters in order to negate the effect of a different one and banish it. So Deviati is really good and sees playing basically every Infernoid deck, a deck which does see competitive play pretty consistently, even if only at tier 2 status. And at number 8, we have Gizmek Kaku, the Supreme Shining Sky stack. This card has the effect where if a monster exists in the extra monster zone, you can special summon this card from your hand and then equip one of those monsters to this card. So it has the ability to special summon itself from the hand and absorb one of your opponent's boss monsters, which is an excellent form of removal since very few cards have protection against that besides just being untargetable. It also has decent stats for a monster that can special summon itself from the hand so easily, and it has an extra effect where if you destroy a monster by battle, you can special summon one of the monsters that's equipped to this card as an equip card. So it gives you the potential to use the monster that you absorb with its first effect. You can also use Union Carrier to equip another monster from your deck to it in order to special summon a wide range of other monsters with a destruction effect. Although since it's a level 9 monster that can special summon itself from the hand pretty easily, it definitely sees a healthy amount of play. And all of its other effects are kind of just bonuses on top of that one. Ease of access for a card goes a long way to whether or not it will see competitive play or not. And at number 7, we have Gem Knight Master Diamond. This was originally the boss monster of the Gem Knight archetype, and for the longest time, it rarely saw play since Gem Knights weren't very good. It really wasn't until Gem Knight Phantom Quartz came out that it started to really shine, as it was the main playmaker in the Gem Knight FTK deck. You see, there's this other Gem Knight fusion monster called Gem Knight Lady Lapis Lazuli, where once per turn, it can allow you to inflict 500 damage to your opponent for each special summon monster on the field. So if you make sure to have a full board of special summon monsters, that's 3000 points of damage. And even more if your opponent has some special summon monsters as well. 
and if you simply activate that effect three times, you can win on your first turn. Although there is one little thing that kind of makes it hard to pull off, and that's the fact that Lady Lapis has a condition where she can only be special summoned once per turn. And that's where Gem Knight Master Diamond comes in. He can be special summoned by any three Gem Knight monsters, and its effect allows you to banish a level 7 or lower Gem Knight Fusion monster from your graveyard in order to treat its name as that monster's name and gain that monster's effect. And part of the conditions for activating Lady Lapis is to send a Gem Knight monster from your deck or extra deck to the graveyard. So, if you simply send another copy of it to the graveyard, you'll be able to easily make sure you have a couple of materials in your graveyard to copy with Master Diamond. Master Diamond can banish that card, copy its effect, then burn for an additional 3,000 points of damage. Although unlike Lady Lapis, Master Diamond doesn't have a hard once per turn on its summon or effect, just a soft once per turn. So you could then just bring out a second copy of Gem Knight Master Diamond and use its effect for a third time in order to win. And Gem Knight Phantom Quartz just allows you to go into this combo a lot more seamlessly as it allows you to add a Gem Knight card from your deck to your hand when it's summoned, it's real easy to bring out, and also allows you to perform a Gem Knight Fusion with cards from your graveyard and banish zone, so it can help reset monsters in order to activate Gem Knight Master Diamond again. And basically, because Gem Knight Master Diamond was so good at facilitating this FTK, they limited the card to one so that it wouldn't be as consistent anymore. Although this just kind of added an extra step to the whole process, where you just bring out Nightmare Unicorn in order to send it back to your extra deck to use it again. Although over time, they kept trying to hit cards in order to stop this combo, with them limiting Master Diamond to one and even banning Brilliant Fusion eventually. And at number six, we have Hot Red Dragon Archfiend Abyss. If you have the ability to cheat a dragon type monster out of your extra deck, this card is kind of the best one to bring out that doesn't require any other kind of setup or a proper special summon. Since this card has the quick effect where once per turn, you can negate the effects of a face-up card on the field until the end of the turn. What this means is you basically gain an Omni Negate, since it does work on spell or trap cards that only exist on the field long enough to activate their effects. So you can negate basically anything, but spell speed 3 or higher effects, which is really good. That's why this card was the premier target for Guard Dragon Argor Pain before it got banned, a card which lets you cheat out a Dragon-type monster from your extra deck. It also has some other effects that are kind of nice things to have in addition to everything else. It allows you to special summon a tuner monster from your graveyard if it inflicts battle damage, and it has higher than normal attack at 3200, which means there's a good chance it'll be able to inflict its damage, and also a good chance your opponent will need to use removal in order to get rid of it. Although bringing the card out normally is kind of a pain, it requires a dark dragon synchro monster specifically as one of its non-tuner materials, but it has a really good negate effect, which is made even better if you can get this card out much easier than its normal synchro summoning method. Which is why this card saw a heavy amount of competitive success in the past when Guard Dragon Argor Pain was still running around unbanned. And at number 5, we have Invoked Macabre. This card is kind of the best Invoked Fusion monster in the archetype that's really good and sees a whole bunch of competitive play because it's so splashable in a whole bunch of different kinds of decks as the entire archetype kind of revolves around fusion summoning with cards from your opponent's graveyard, and being able to perform those fusion summons super easily thanks to their main monster, Alistair the Invoker, and their fusion spell card working in tandem in order to give you a whole bunch of advantage after performing those fusion summons. And the archetype kind of has a fusion monster for each attribute, and Invoked Macabre is just the attribute of light. It has the effect where, if a card effect is activated, you can send a card of the same type from your hand to the graveyard, to negate the activation and then banish that card. So exactly like the counter trap card Ultimate Providence, just in monster card form and a banish instead of a destruction effect which is much better. And at number 4, we have number 95, Galaxy Eyes Dark Matter Dragon. This is a 4000 attack rank 9 monster which has the effect where you can detach one of its materials to allow it to attack up to two monsters during each battle phase. Although the real reason this card saw play is because the effect that happens when it's brought out. When this card is XC summoned, you can send three dragon type monsters with different names from your deck to the graveyard in order to make your opponent banish three monsters from their deck. And there are so many decks that benefit from having dragons in the graveyard that this effect alone is kind of busted. Especially with how easy this card is to bring out, since its first effect is the ability to cheat itself out of the extra deck by ranking it up on top of any Galaxy Eyes XC's monster you control. So, it's easy to bring out, 
has a borderline busted mill effect as soon as it comes out, has very high attack for how easy it is to bring out, and then has the ability to attack twice. You'd think all of this would be the reason why this card is currently banned, but actually, it's 100% just because of the ability to send three dragons to the grave. There's a reason cards like Foolish Burial are limited to one copy. It's a card that technically makes you go minus one in order to just send one monster from your deck to the graveyard. And Dark Matter Dragon kind of lets you send three as a side effect, and there's just so many good dragons to send to the grave. Like Tempest, Arc Brave, Mana Dragon, Dark Worm, Brotar, the Guard Dragons, and those are just the generic ones that aren't banned. Once you go into specific archetype dragons, the list gets even bigger. You could essentially go plus three off its mill effect, which is kind of why this card is banned. Because even if it was a little bit more difficult to bring out, that would still be pretty good. And at number three, we have True King Lithosagem the Disaster. This is a card which was banned for a while and is currently limited to one copy per deck, as it has this effect where it can special summon itself from your hand as long as you destroy two other monsters you control or that are in your hand, as long as one of them is an earth monster. And then it has an additional effect where if you destroy two earth monsters for its summoning condition, you can then look at your opponent's extra deck and banish up to three monsters in it with different names. And this effect right here is kind of why the card got banned. It then goes on to have a floating effect to special summon another worm type monster from your graveyard if it's destroyed by a card effect, which is a nice bonus as well. But the thing about extra deck monsters is that a lot of decks only play one copy of their key combo pieces in the extra deck, and sometimes their combo pieces are just limited to one copy where they can only play one, like Gem Knight Master Diamond. So bringing out Lithosa Gem on your first turn could basically win you the game right there, if you just banish the three cards that their deck needs in order to win, or to get rid of three cards from your opponent that they could use to out any strategy you might be trying to use. And that's not even the end of it. This card also benefits very greatly with the Dinosaur archetype, as it has cards like Baby Sarasaurus and PT Pteranodon that are Earth monsters that allow you to special summon dinosaurs from your deck when they're destroyed by card effects. So you could basically go plus two off of just summoning Lithosa Gym, while also completely ending your opponent's potential to play the game by banishing three cards they might absolutely need to accomplish what their deck is trying to do. It's just kind of a game-winning effect on its own. Although, only if you're playing against the deck which needs those specific kinds of cards. There's some meta decks which don't even use their extra deck, and some where it's just kind of a toolbox that's nice to have, but might even play cards like Pot of Extravagance to use their extra deck as a resource to draw cards anyway. So it could be a completely game-winning effect, or an inconvenience that just happens to give you nice pluses if you're playing a dinosaur deck. But I think that's probably why they eventually just limited to one of the ban lists instead of keeping it banned. So it's still really good, but not as consistent to use if there was three copies available. And at number two, we have True King of All Calamities. This is a rank 9 Xyz monster which just requires any two plus level 9 monsters as materials, and has an effect to basically shut down your opponent's monster effects for a turn. Where on a quick effect, this card can detach one of its materials to declare one attribute, and for the rest of the turn, all monsters on the field become that attribute, and your opponent can't activate any monster effects or attack with monsters that have that attribute. So if you declare fire, for example, and your opponent summons a monster that's not fire, it will become fire due to True King's effect, and then be unable to activate its effect or declare an attack. And the only way to stop this effect is to negate it upon activation, and if you use it as soon as your opponent draws a card, it's pretty hard for them to try to negate the effect. And also, another little interesting thing to note about the effect is that it can also affect monsters in the hand and graveyard, as long as they are of the attribute you declared. So if your opponent has a whole bunch of fire monsters, for example, you can completely shut them down for a turn if you just declare that attribute. Although if you don't care about shutting down the cards other than the ones on the field, you can just declare whatever you want and just kind of pick divine for fun. This card's effects are so good and so easy to use that it kind of single-handedly gives level nine monsters really good support. It makes that level very valuable because of the potential to go into true king of all calamities. And the effect is so good that I think it kind of beats out two cards which were previously banned. And at number one, we have Trishula, Dragon of the Ice Barrier. This is a card which has been on and off the ban list ever since it first came out, being completely banned more often than not, as the card is currently limited to one copy. And it has a very simple effect, 
When this card is synchro summoned, you can banish one card from your opponent's hand, field, and graveyard, with the card chosen from your opponent's hand being one at random. The monster is supposed to be bounced by the fact that it requires at least three monsters for its synchro summon, as its materials are one tuner plus two or more non-tuners, so you need to use three monsters to go into this one in order to get rid of three cards from your opponent. Now, here's what's broken about this card. This effect is not once per turn. It does not target, and it attacks the hand. Those three things are kind of hallmarks of broken cards, because since it's not once per turn, you can just keep bringing out other copies of this card and keep using its effect. You can use cards like Desynchro in order to just reset the effect and use it twice with the same materials. Since it doesn't target, your opponent can't preemptively activate their cards upon selection in order to kind of save themselves, and they have to preemptively activate their spells by two effects or lose them without being able to use them. And since it attacks the hand, it's an excellent card to use on your first turn, even if your opponent doesn't have a field set up, because being able to snipe cards from your opponent's starting hand is kind of broken. And there's a lot of cards in the ban list whose sole effect is to get rid of cards from your opponent's hand a little bit too easily. And if your opponent does have monsters on the field, the ability to non-target banish one of them is one of the best forms of removal in the game. And what's hilarious about this card is that it belongs to one of the weakest archetypes in the game, the Ice Barriers. They have a whole bunch of really bad main deck monsters and cards, but they kind of knock it out of the park when it comes to broken extract monsters, as three of them have appeared on the ban list at some point in time, with one of them needing an errata to ever come off the ban list. It's kind of surprising Trishula didn't also get an errata, but honestly it wasn't as broken as Brionic of the Ice Barrier. Trishula is so good that it's one of the few synchro monsters which was put back on the ban list in some way, after coming off of it during Master Rule 4, when they heavily restricted extra deck summoning methods with the new Link monsters. Because even during Master Rule 4, before the revisions, Trishula was still kinda strong, and got a nice little boost once the revisions came out and synchro monsters became a lot easier to use. Trishula also has a whole bunch of retrains, all of them trying to fix how broken this card was by simulating its effect with the more better one being Necroz of Trishula, which basically has the same effect, except it has a hard once per turn on its banish, and requires your opponent to have those three cards in those three locations to even use its effect. So you know the original is kind of busted when its retrains have overly balanced versions of the same effect, which is why it takes number one spot on this list. Honestly, the top four spots are all super good. The level nine monsters are surprisingly stronger than you'd think, considering how unpopular that level has historically been. All right, and that's the list. Do you know of any other level nine monsters which are better than the ones in this video that I should have mentioned? If so, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, as well as ideas for future videos just like this one. And also, did you know only 40.2% of people who watch these videos are actually subscribed to the channel?